Great. Lovely to see you. Just giving it a few more minutes. There we go. We're on the hour now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual bird tour. Today, I have the honor of introducing Rock Jumper Birding Tours, senior full-time tour leader, David Hodenod, who will take us on a journey to the wonders of Morocco, famous for its markets, spices, cuisine, and remarkable birding opportunities. David has extensive experience leading birding tours throughout Africa, Asia, and Madagascar. He is well known in birding circles for his endless energy and legendary bird spotting skills. His zeal for bird guiding has earned him the reputation as one of the world's most talented birders. David is also the longest member of Rock Jumper, having started 20 years ago in 2001. <laughs> Can you believe that? It was around about this time now, David, that you started. <laughs> but it goes back even further. I was chatting to Adam Riley, and he was saying that he has been birding with you since 1992. Recently, David formed the Bird Diversity Consultants, where he helps properties improve their bird diversity by planting indigenous trees and shrubs and eradicating alien plants. When not guiding, David has been involved in surveys for wind farms to assess rare and localized species in the proposed areas and to reduce the impact of bird fatality. Welcome, David. And before we begin, a quick note to say um, that a recorded version of this webinar will be available in 48 hours, an email to you, and the Q&A will be held at the end. Thank you, David, and take us to Morocco. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thanks very much indeed. Um, part of your introduction makes me feel a little bit older, a few gray hairs on the side, but <laughs> <laughs> thanks anyway. But no, it's been an incredible 20 years working uh, for Rock Jumper. And I'd also like to take this opportunity just to thank um, some colleagues and friends who've also contributed to some of the photos you're going to be seeing tonight. Um, so thanks very much to Adam and Felicity Riley and to Clayton Byrne and Keith Valentine. So to start with uh, my, my talk tonight, um, I'd just like to thank everyone so much for joining me. It's it's wonderful to be speaking to you all about uh, Morocco and uh, this fabulous trip. I'm going to start off with just uh, saying why to uh, Morocco and here's some of the reasons. So it's a really friendly nation, um, good infrastructure, including accommodation, roads and communication, good food. Um, just to elaborate a little bit on that, um, if you're not familiar with tagines, in Morocco, they serve these wonderful tagines. Um, it's a frequent feature of the trip. And a tagine is basically a, a dish that's prepared in a little clay oven and it's steamed and the food is really delicious. And along with Moroccan spices, it's really a treat. Um, then continuing, um, there's great climate. Uh, best time to travel is during the month of May. However, you can travel all the way from February through to May, February, March, still wintry trips, and then April, May into spring. And the fantastic birds, of course, and all North African endemics, including the Valence woodpecker, Tristram's warbler, Musia's red start, African crimson winged finch, Atlas pied flycatcher, which is a recent split, and probably the iconic bird of the region is the northern bald ibis. Uh, which is now critically endangered. And the official list for Morocco is 483. And in the 13 day tour, we see about 220 species. So, so nearly half of that total. There's also some interesting wildlife, including Barbary sheep and Barbary ape, um, stunning scenery and great photographic opportunities. We also embark on a sea pelagic trip to look for seabirds and a really good place to look for Balearic shearwater. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, it's a 13-day comprehensive tour, so it gives you a really good coverage of the country and its birds and mammals in uh, just two weeks. And if you'd like to add another week to that, there's the beautiful Canary Islands, 
which we also offer an extension to. So now to uh, just the position of Morocco here in the northwestern area of Africa. You can see um, the capital on the coast, Rabat, and the famous city of Casablanca, just to the south of it. And then the central, more centralized city of Marrakesh, which is where we uh, start the tour. So to the east of Morocco, you have this huge country of Algeria, the northeast, the Mediterranean Sea, to the north, Spain, to the west, the Atlantic Ocean, and here are the Canary Islands, and to the south, the disputed territory, Western Sahara. So then on to um, the main itinerary, I'm going to run through it more or less and try and give you a bit of insight to um, the daily schedule through the itinerary. So here's a little bit more detailed map of Morocco with Rabat there and Marrakesh down sort of central here. So one flies into Marrakesh, that's where we start the tour. And it's a good idea to overnight before the tour because we leave on the first morning quite early. And Marrakesh is a fabulous city with lots of wonderful souks, um, incredible markets to go and visit. Also quite a historical city with some wonderful forts and um, mosques. So well worth a day exploring Marrakesh. So onto the tour itself. And we start off heading up into the high atlas. You can see the snow-capped peaks in the background, some argan trees in the foreground. And we, we travel through from Marrakesh up into the high atlas to an area called Akumdin, which actually is a ski resort in the Atlas Mountains. And the high atlas there where we go up to is 2,600 meters. So we're talking around seven, seven and a half thousand feet, so quite high. Um, and to start with, on the first day, you may well see the fabulous Musia's Red Start, which is a North African endemic, a really stunning little bird. And we have numerous opportunities to see it, and hopefully we'll see them on a regular occurrence. But even the first day, as we start to climb up into the atlas, uh, there's areas of scrub. We make a few birding stops, and we regularly see this little chap. Absolutely stunning little bird. And then on to another specialty, Levalence woodpecker, in the same area. So amazing. On the first morning, you can be seeing some of two top uh, North African endemics. And it's uh, a large woodpecker, nearly uh, as big as green woodpecker, um, which occurs in Europe. And then hawfinch, so quite a lot of Palearctic or European species uh, that occur in uh, North Africa and particularly in Morocco. Um, and in the conifers up, sort of halfway up the slopes, we may see hawfinch as well as this cute little chap called firecrest, common firecrest. Um, he has a missile thrush and another shot of it in the snow. Spectacular birds. And as we climb higher up onto the plateau itself, we uh, often encounter little groups of horned larks, another exquisite species. Regularly see them up on the snow line. And then another real specialty, this African crimson wing finch is also yeah, a North African endemic. And one of the best places to see it is up at Akumdin near the ski resorts. This was taken in the snow. You can see a little bit of snow falling. Um, and they're often around the snow line, feeding around the, the ski resorts. As well as both species of chuff, red bulled and alpine, um, are both up there in good numbers. Um, and then onto a cute little mammal, the Barbary squirrel. He also occurs quite high up in the Atlas Mountains, as well as a bit lower down in the middle Atlas. And this is some more scenery from the top. You can see even in uh, May, you can still have some of these high peaks covered in snow. So it can be uh, quite chilly in the mornings. Um, and there's mist rising from the lowlands. Also other European species we see up there are um, white-throated dipper, which occurs on the, the fast flowing streams and um, meadow pipit on the plains on the top. 
Um, yeah, so quite good diversity here and just stunning scenery all around, good light for photo photography throughout the trip. It's really, really good. Okay, so moving on from uh, Ocumden, the High Atlas, we actually overnight just uh, the base of the mountain and we sometimes see um, a form of Tawny Owl, which has been recently split as Makhreb Owl, um, close to our accommodations, in fact. And then um, the following day, we leave uh, Akumden and we start heading down over the Test Pass, which is down the mountains into the lowlands and all the way to the coast of Agadir on the west coast there. On the way, the Test Pass, we sometimes get lucky to see this fabulous uh, Barbary sheep. Clayton actually took this photo, fantastic, uh, in the snow. Um, but even in, in May, when there's less snow, we, we still have pretty good chances of seeing them uh, on the pass. And then, so we, we make our way down to Agadir for three nights. Uh, it's a wonderful base on the coast, lovely climate. And um, the following day, we embark on the Pelagic, a seabird trip off the Atlantic coast. And we often get to see uh, northern Gannet on those trips in good numbers. Um, quite often there's uh, sardine boats coming in to the harbour as we head out and um, the gannets are often around them along with many species of gulls. Also sometimes great skewer, uh, which is feeding a bit further out. And then the special, which is Balearic shearwater we look for on the coastline and it's quite an endangered bird. Uh, here's another shot of it over the waves. In winter, if you do an earlier trip, sort of February, March, then you can see uh, species like Razable and uh, common scoter as well. And here's a white-faced storm petrel, which is quite a rarity, and we were very lucky to see on our last uh, May trip. And then um, the following day, we embark on a search for this fantastic bird, the Northern Bald Ibis. Adam managed to get this amazing photo. I'm not quite sure how he got it, but what a cracking bird. And uh, you can see lovely gloss on the wing there. Um, and it looks a bit similar to our southern ball armus, but the head shape's quite different and the shaggy crest. Um, and very few numbers. So we're talking uh, less than a thousand birds. And there's a couple of colonies around Tamri. So in the morning, we um, do the, the pelagic trip and then head up to Tamri in the afternoon to search for this old Arbus. And we've been very fortunate to see it on, on all of our tours. So there's a really good chance to see it. Um, and then the following day, we uh, search a coastline as well for some other local specials, Orduan's Gull. And um, we may also see Great Grey Shrike. This is uh, the coastal um, subspecies. and uh, we visit two fabulous estuaries, the Udmasa and Udsus. And so a host of shorebirds, some ducks, even marbled duck is possible there, and uh, many species of gulls and waders. Really good day for, for two estuaries. And in the evening, we'll try, sometimes we get lucky for around dusk for redneck nightjar. Um, also in the area, spotless starling. Very similar to the Eurasian, but you can see no, no spots. And the lovely woodchat shrike along the coastline. Really stunning. There's a wonderful selection of birds. And here's a bird we're more familiar with in sub-Saharan Africa, the black crowned chagra, but occurs uh, along um, the estuaries in Morocco. And, a reasonably good chance of seeing that there. And a lovely Barbary partridge, often a little covey, sometimes five or six. We also quite regularly see around with Masa. And if we're lucky, sorry, not a great photo, but you can see the dark underwing coverts, which is a key feature for Eleonora's falcon. And in the month of May, it's good chances we've seen several birds around Utsus in May. And then from uh, Agadir, we start heading east towards the desert. So this is the high atlas running here, and we 
run just south of that, across to Urzazat, and then to Bulmani Dudadas. So that's quite a, a day trip, but good comfortable road with um, several birding stops en route. And we get into the more desert species like uh, this cream-colored corsa. Um, what a fantastic bird. Often also small groups, three or five in a loose group. And um, from Bulmani, we have two nights there because the following day uh, we spend in the Tagdalt, which is basically the highest stony desert. And um, this is one of the key targets for that area. There's another shot of it. Magnificent, very similar in a way to our virtual Corsa with a gray nape, but much paler in plumage. And then another star of the area in the Tagdalt is the greater Hupulok. Lovely bird. Doesn't show much color when perched, but in flight, spectacular with these striking wing bars, big two white wing bars. Really stunning bird. And it's got a wonderful call and, and display. It flies vertically up and then stoops down, opening its wings just before it lands. Um, really nice to watch the display and listen to its call as well. And then another real special, yes, yeah, thick billed lark. Um, the Tagdalt's one of the key areas to see it, but we've now found about three or four sites where we have a good chance to track this down. Usually takes quite a bit of searching. But again, we've been lucky to see it on all our trips. And you can see this huge bill that cracks open sort of hard seeds with. Beautiful, quite a large lark. And then also the area is well known for its sand grouse. So black-bellied sand grouse is one of the, the more commoner species we may see. And if we're lucky, this pintailed, which is an eruptive species. Some years they're good numbers on the tag belt and other years they don't seem to be any around. They go further north towards the Mediterranean, but uh, it's a stunning bird. There's a shot and some scrub on the tag delt, and then another shot in flight. Really, really beautiful. Look at those incredible markings on the wing. And another cute little bird, often in little groups, two, three, five, or seven, and uh, trumpet to finch. Um, it's often feeding on little weeds and seeds at the roadside. Also on the tag dot, you can see quite stony the ground underneath. Another shot of them there. Beautiful surfaced with pink on the belly. Really stunning little bird. And then if we're very lucky, this is a rare sighting, the Hubara busted. Um, they used to be far more common on the tag delt and, and throughout Morocco in the desert areas, but sadly are quite endangered there now. Mostly, I think the main issue has been with falconers actually hunting them. Um, so their numbers are quite threatened. But fortunately, as I mentioned a little earlier about the Canary Island extension, there's a very good chance to see it in the Canary Islands if you, you don't get lucky to see it in Morocco. And then um, from the morning on the tag dot, we head up to the Dodges, Dodges Gourd in the afternoon. And um, Felicity took this great photo. It gives really nice contrast of the size of these cliffs. Some thousand meters, some of these cliffs soar up. And uh, it's a wonderful area, very photographic and also good for some species like uh, desert lark. Um, quite often in the rocky areas around the gorge as well as the sought after Benelli's eagle. This is a magnificent bird, often goes soaring along the ridge tops. And um, the dart is gone to one of the better places to see it. We'll have several opportunities to find it. Um, and also again, takes quite a bit of searching and scanning the horizons, but usually we, we encounter it somewhere on the trip. And then uh, just another scene from uh, a little bit more scenery. You can see um, this is a casbah, sort of a walled fortress with um, dwellings inside and uh, near the Todra Gorge, which we visit the following morning. Here's some more images of the Todra Gorge. You can see even 
small palm trees growing in the gorge, not much vegetation, it's really quite arid. And we look for a few different specials in this gorge, um, one of which is the Tristram's warbler. What a magnificent little bird this is. Um, really stunning with this chestnut on the wings and belly. And again, as a North African endemic, so one of the real targets, but we have very good chances to see it. There's another shot of it. They can be quite confiding, sometimes come really quite close. And then in the same area in the gorge, if we're lucky, we can find this little mammal, this cute little common gundi, um, kind of looks like a large guinea pig. And little owl, which is, um, it's hard to judge the size here, but um, probably about 25, 30 centimeters, um, just over a foot high. So that was Bulman there and Todra Gorge to the east. And then we continue further east and down to the Great Sahara Desert around our foot. And we spend uh, two nights there. En route, we may see a uh, fulvus babbler, which is quite a, a noisy little bird as, as babblers can be. It likes the scrubby vegetation en route. And we, we stop at a couple of wadis. Wadis are sort of dry riverbeds, um, sort of drainage lines where there's a little bit more vegetation, thicker growth, and they, they often, you often find little flocks in these wadis. As well as another special streaked scrub warbler, and this species is in its own family, a monotypic family. So there's only, I think, 250 families of birds in the world. And this is one family, just this one species, streaked scrub warbler, a real special. And there's a couple of sites we look for it. It's one of the big targets on the day heading east to our foot. And here's one that's just caught a, a caterpillar, a little worm. And then to Erfurt itself and uh, the great sand dunes of Erkchebi, which is on the edge of the Sahara Desert, a magnificent place. I don't know if you can quite see, but these little specks here on the dunes are people, just to give you a, a size, rough uh, estimate of how big these dunes are. Very, very impressive indeed. And it's a stunning area. We spend a full day in this area and um, it's quite sandy. So we use four by four vehicles and um, we travel around here looking for the specials of the area, um, which are also sand grass. So chances here for spotted and crowned sand grass. You'll probably also see um, some camels around uh, the Sahara. They seem to do so well in these arid conditions. More pics of great to Hoopalark, so more chances to see this fabulous bird. Um, it's just fantastic. and. Uh, You'll see in several areas, both in the sandy desert as well as the, the tagged or the stony desert, they occur. So very good chances to see it again. And again, quite confiding. You can see it by the photos, you get fairly close. They're not very shy. As well as some other larks. So greater short-toed lark. Slightly rufous on the crown there. And also, and usually in flocks, 10, 15 birds. And then the sand grass, so crowned uh, has this black mask on the male, quite distinctive. So otherwise, it's quite similar to the spotted sand grass. And here's spotted male, see lacking the mask, lovely bright throat, long tail streamers. So you might wonder why is it called spotted sand grass, actually named after the female. I don't have a photo of the female, but she's all spotted on the chest. And bar-tailed lark, quite a pale, sort of a pale version of the desert lark I showed you earlier and a little bit smaller, likes the sandy areas rather than the rocky areas. And then another special of the area is the African desert warbler and occurs in the scrub and sort of tall grass in the dry wadis, really well camouflaged and got a lovely call. And then even more cryptic, 
uh, really camouflage, you can make out just here is the head, the bill and the eye uh, of Egyptian nightjar. And in recent years, we've been lucky. I think the last six tours we've seen the species. So good chances for it. Often um, we find them on a day roost. So yeah, really lucky because then they just relaxed. You can view them at a distance with a telescope. Um, see it really well. There's another shot. It's just incredible camouflage as the bird here. And just blends into its surroundings so well. And another special there, so not a lot of species, um, but real specials, many of which you can't see uh, outside of, of um, North Africa. Um, quite a few of these birds also shared with Tunisia and some in Egypt, um, but by far the highest diversity is in Morocco. And this is the desert sparrow, also occurs down in the, in the Sahara, in the dunes there. Very striking, this pale body and then the black throat. The, as well as white-crowned wheat here. Now the wheat here are, are quite a few species occurring on the route. I think about six species we should see. And very striking, this white-crowned black wheat here in the rocky areas, especially in the lowlands. And desert wheat here. Very striking as well. Also, often where you get desert wheat here, you get desert warbler. They often occur together. And fair eagle owl, another sought after species which we look for up in the rocky crags. There's sort of some hills and, and uh, rocky slopes. And um, we'll check several areas where we've seen them in the past. They often move their roosts, so not always reliable, but We've been very fortunate to see it on nearly all of our trips. Okay, and then so from the full day in the Sahara, we then start heading north towards the Middle Atlas, up towards uh, Medelt. And this is our key target around Medelt. The following day, we look in the early morning for this very secretive and elusive bird called DuPont's Lark. And it's uh, probably one of the best areas to search for it. It can be uh, really hard to find. They're very elusive and they creep low to the ground. Um, but if you go early in the morning, often they're calling and then we can usually track it down. Oh, fantastic. Another lark for the area. And then that's the special around Modult. So from the middle atlas, Continuing, it's quite wide here, the Middle Atlas. It goes right up to your frame, and we continue north to your frame. And another key bird around your frame is Atlas Pied Flycatcher. And it's a stunning little flycatcher. It was, um, it's in fact, there's still a bit of a mystery about it because they're not quite sure where it winters. So it breeds in Morocco, and you can see here it's probably at a nest hole. It just recently arrived, early May and may well nest here. Um, and it has this large white forehead. So the European pied flycatcher just has a small white forehead. That's the main difference from this view. And then there's a little difference in the wing as well. But um, the interesting thing is it just breeds in uh, northern Morocco here in the middle atlas. Um, but where it winters, no one's quite sure. We, we suspect places like Ghana in West Africa um, but I think it's still yet to be determined exactly where they winter. There's another shot uh, out. Um, quite a prominent white uh, wing bar there as well. And great spotted woodpeckers, another species we often see in the middle atlas, um, often a little mixed flocks, sometimes short uh, tree keeper as well. So, then from Ephraim, we continue a little bit. So we've done a really nice loop here and continuing back towards the capital Rabat, where we have uh, our final two nights. And our special, the next day we visit an area called Sidi Baraba. And uh, this is a fantastic duck, uh, white-headed duck and rather localized. In fact, I think on the tour, this is our only site but it, it does seem reliable in the last, uh, all the last trips that we've been there, uh, we've managed to see it. Um, really fantastic bird. Other places it occurs is in Southern Spain. Um, 
but uh, this place on the coast, in the northwest of Morocco, does seem reliable for it. And there's another shot with a, a very stiff tail they can show at times. And around Udlukos, uh, we, if we're very lucky, we can see Eurasian pendulum tip. This is a, a rare photograph. It's a real rarity in Morocco. Um, but we did encounter it on our last tour there. And uh, the same area is wonderful marshes. So you can see harriers and, if you're lucky, spotted crake, as well as another real special, the moustached warbler, occurs in the reed beds there. So a full day in the marshes um, north of the capital. Um, that's the end of the trip. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, David. That's fantastic. Wow. Really, really special. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, and uh, a quick note uh, before we go into Q&A, and thank you, I see so many questions coming through. Um, having a look here, we have um, um, our next webinar, which will be held in um, two weeks time, is actually going to be on two different dates. So um, just be aware that it is going to run on a Tuesday, September the 14th, and it's going to run on a Wednesday, September the 15th. And that's if you're in New York, it'll be Tuesday at um, 4 p.m. If you're based in London, it'll be 9 p.m. Tuesday. If you're in Johannesburg, South Africa, it's 10 p.m. for you on Tuesday. Um, but if you're in Auckland, it'll be Wednesday, 8 a.m. and Wednesday, 6 a.m. if you're in Sydney. And it's going to be with our Kiwi, Kiwi full-time tour leader, Eric Forsyth. Um, and he'll be taking us on a venture down under to explore the fascinating lands of Eastern Australia. Um, our guide's GoFundMe donation page is still open and the link shared um, now in your chat um, is available if you'd like to make a donation to our guides. And yeah, let's get started on some Q&A. So the very first question that came in, and I'm just going to go into the, into the chat because it came there. It talked about the, the heat and fitness requirements. Um, what is the heat and fitness requirements and what are the size of the tour group and accommodation? Good question uh, there, thank you. Um, so climate uh, in May is very, very pleasant. It's mild in the highlands and um, in the lowlands really doesn't get too hot in the Sahara, it's, it's quite comfortable. Um, and the walking is, is really easy, quite a bit of driving on the trip from sites to sites, but we climb out and the walking is really not challenging at all. Um, it's a very comfortable, easy going trip. Oh, awesome. Paul, Paul's saying, are there other uh, names for the furless uh, uh, barbler and the street scrub warbler? I couldn't find either in Birds of the World. Uh, okay. Yeah, it depends on the taxonomy. We, we follow the IOC. But sometimes it's just called scrub warbler rather than street scrub warbler. Um, and fulvus chatterer rather than fulvus babbler. Um, the naming is always a bit of a... <laughs> Tricky, but I think they, they are trying to come up with a, a single common name that's used around the world. There's an organization that's trying to get that, that sort at the moment. It'll make life a lot easier for everyone. Um, and then uh, Kina is asking, why do they call them the Barbary sheep, monkey or squirrel? Uh, what does uh, bar Barbary mean? Barbary. Um, I'm not too sure offhand, actually. No worries. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, night jars, uh, would they both be present in the February tour? In the February tour? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's probably a little bit early for the Egyptian night jar. We, we quite often see the redneck then, but Egyptian seems to be a little later in the season. 
Oh, great. Any chances of the Lichtenson's uh, sand grouse and morning uh, wheat ear? I missed those two species when I was in Mor Morocco many years ago. Okay, yes, Lichtenstein sand grouse is very difficult. Um, it seems that also it's a little bit, you get these influxes where they move into the desert areas. And on all our trips, we haven't recorded it there. So I think uh, you'd have to be very, very lucky to see uh, Lichtensteins uh, there. It's better, more easily seen in places in Kenya and uh, Ethiopia, Lichtenstein sand grouse. And the morning wheat here, which is now split actually as Maghreb wheat here, uh, very good chances. It's a, it's a rare bird and low density, but we've been seeing it on all, all our trips. We've got some good sites for that. Oh, Ian is saying you didn't mention the marsh owl. The marsh owl, <laughs> yeah, marsh owl is uh, is tricky. It's around. Um, most people seem to see it around Mergerzerga, which is an old site where the famous slenderbolt curly, which is sadly prob probably extinct now, used to occur. Um, and marsh owl still gets seen there from time to time, but we don't actually visit that spot on the trip. Um, yeah, so you're unlikely to see Marshall. Oh, someone, Nigel, thank you, Nigel. Nigel's just come in and says, Barbary is an old name for the North African region. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> Louise is um, asking here, other than the two birds you mentioned, are there any differences in what uh, you may see between the early and late tours, especially rechance of seeing the bald ibis? or the uh, pharaoh eagle, uh, eagle owl? Okay, yeah, for those two species, any time of year, uh, between February and May is fine. We've seen them on both seasons. Um, just that February and March can be really cold. So you have to go well prepared. It's funny, some years it's a bit milder and it's, it's not too bad, but it can be really, really cold. Um, Donna's asking, what can you tell us about the Canary Island extension? Yeah, so that's a, another wonderful sort of a week-long trip. We visit uh, two main islands, uh, being Fuerteventura, the uh, really dry, arid, uh, more coastal island. And it's got its own set of um, special endemics. Um, Fuerteventura stone chat is the main one there, but others that are shared like Berthelow's pipit, you can also see there. So a number of interesting species, an Egyptian vulture actually is a, it's a widespread bird, but fairly common there. And then we go across to the more lush island of Tenerife and the two special pigeons you look for, Laurel and Vols pigeon up in the highlands. So it, it works out around about with flights, it's about a week week's extension to the Canaries. And also, um, very easy going, um, no real tough hikes. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really comfortable extension and a really nice climate. Oh, lovely. Um, another question here is, why does the northern bald ibis have a feathered, a featherless head? I'm not sure why it's featherless. I think that's how it was designed. Uh, our southern bald ibis is, is similar. Um, what it what it gains by having the bald head, I'm not quite sure. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's quite striking. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, Alan is asking, I saw Pied Flycatcher um, at eight sites in Morocco in 1983. I was not aware this had been split uh, to the Atlas Pied Flycatcher. That's, that's interesting. So both European pied and atlas pied occur in Morocco, um, but it depends on what time of year you went because the atlas pied arrives from its wintering grounds only in May. So if you were there in May or June, then that's when atlas pied is there and breeding and the European pied would have already gone to Europe. So um, yeah, it just depends on the time of year that you were there. You can probably work out. And also the area you saw it. Um, the middle atlas seems to be around Efrain, uh, the best area for the atlas pied flycatcher. 
um, whereas the European part is more widespread across Morocco oh, in wow. the woodlands, yeah. Um, Alan's saying he was there in April uh, 1983. Wow. Okay, <laughs> so it's probably a bit early then for Atlas part, they're more likely to be European part fly catchers. Yeah. Um, Gail's asking, on the Canary extensions, uh, do you do a pelagic? Um, yes, there is a, a, we do a ferry trip actually um, from uh, Tenerife. We do a, a boat trip that we've been going out to look for shearwaters and sometimes see quarry shearwater on, on, the, on the ferry trip. It's a, basically a ferry crossing. We go across for the morning and then come back early afternoon. Um, I've done it about four times and it's been really good for quarry shearwater. But haven't seen too much else. In, the, in years gone by, sort of 10, 15 years ago, they used to record little shearwater and a number of other interesting species. But on recent trips, we haven't recorded much other than the, the quarries. Um, um, I love what Sherry writes here in the chat. She says, Thanks, David. We were with you in South Africa in November 2014. It was uh, the one the Cape Sugarbird hits in the chest after after a truck. <laughs> yeah, interesting one there. Thanks. Um, let's see. We got down to the very last um, questions now. If you have any more, please do drop them in the Q and A. Ian is saying, is there a strong inter interest in bird conservation in Morocco? Um, yeah, it's it's a good question. You know, in in um, there's, there's not a lot of reserves that we visit. Many of the birds are in open countryside um, with, with not many national parks designated. Um, and yeah, we haven't found many local Moroccan guides. There's a few site guides at um, places like Udmasa and around Temri. Um, but once you get into the desert, we haven't seen um, many guides or, or much presence of um, conservation folks. So certainly the, I think it, it, it does require, especially for the Hubara busted, they are doing some breeding, uh, captive breeding for that. Um, and there is certainly a program for the Hubara. But apart from that, for the other species, I'm not sure how much uh, work has been done. So, um, yeah, it would be it would be probably best to contact BirdLife International to find out more about that. Absolutely, um, George uh, is asking: Do you find um, Marib uh, wheat ear on your tour? If so, what area? Yes, the the Maghreb wheat ear um, is uh, good chances. In so there's the Maghreb wheat ear and there's also the Atlas wheat ear. Both are recently split. The Maghreb wheat ear is the split from morning. And the Atlas wheat ear is a split from northern wheat ear. So Maghreb wheat ear is in the in the sandy and stony desert towards the Sahara. So basically between um Dardis and Ufrut in that general area, we've been seeing the Maghreb. And then the Atlas wheat ear up at Ukamdan and also in the middle Atlas. Great, thanks. Um, Annie is saying, what is the best field guide for Morocco? Um, there's a great field guide, a Collins field guide. It's um, the birds of North Africa and Europe. Uh, it's a Collins field guide, and that really represents all the species for, for the region, yeah. Oh, great. And Tracy's saying, you mentioned Barbary ape. Uh, where would that be seen? Yes, I didn't mention. So that's around a frame in the middle atlas, and also very good chances to see that. Um, often in small troops um, at the roadside, they become habituated to people. So I think they beg for food and some of the, the truck drivers toss out scraps for them. So they're often by the roadside. Very good chances of seeing Barbary Ape. Thanks. Um, very last comment here. Um, thank you, Adrian. He's saying there's a lot of work done at university by the students and the PhD students regarding surveying and habitat protection particularly in Western Sahara. 
So thank you very much for, for giving us that example. And, and that is a wrap. So thank you everyone for joining us. As always, we really love this time that we get to spend with you. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks time at a slightly different time. But thank you, David. It's always a pleasure having you. Um, thank you for taking on, us on this great virtual tour. And to everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. Eh? Bye. Thanks so much, Nikki. And thank you to everyone. Bye-bye.